God sent the angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. Don't be frightened, Mary, the angel told her. God has chosen to bless you. You will become pregnant and have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. But Mary asked the angel, How can I have a baby? I am a virgin. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby born to you will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. While Mary was still a virgin, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her fiancé, being a just man, decided to break the engagement quietly so as not to disgrace her publicly. And as he considered this, he fell asleep, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, don't be afraid to go ahead with your marriage to Mary, for the child in her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this happened to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Behold, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son. He will be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. This prophecy from Isaiah 714 was given 700 years before Jesus was born. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He brought Mary home to be his wife, but she remained a virgin until her son was born. And at that time, the Roman Emperor, Augustus, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. All returned to their own town to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled from the village of Nazareth in Galilee and took with him Mary, his wife, who was great with child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. That night, there were shepherds in the fields outside the village guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terribly frightened, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news of great joy for everyone, a savior, Yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born tonight in Bethlehem, the city of David. And this is how you will recognize him. You will find a baby lying in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host from heaven, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The angel left, and the shepherds said to each other, Come. Let us go to Bethlehem and see this wonderful thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they ran to the village, and they found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. And the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the story were astonished, but Mary kept these things in her heart. The shepherds went back to their fields, glorifying and praising God. Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod, and at the same time came wise men from the east to Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We have seen his star that arose and have come to worship him. Herod was deeply disturbed by their question, as was all of Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law. Where do the prophets say the Messiah will be born? he asked. In Bethlehem, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. O Bethlehem of Judea, you're not just a lowly village of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be a shepherd for my people Israel. This prophecy found in Micah chapter 5 verse 2 and 2 Samuel chapter 5 verse 2. Both were written 700 years before Jesus was born. So Herod sent a message to the wise men asking them to come and see him. At this meeting, he learned the exact time when they first saw the star. And then he told them, Go to Bethlehem, search diligently for the child. 
And when you find him, come and tell me that I may go and worship him too. After this meeting, the wise men went on their way, and once again the star appeared to them to guide them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house where the child and his mother were, and they fell down and worshipped him. They opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But when it was time to leave, they went another way, because God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise men were gone, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod will try and kill the child. That very night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Herod was furious when he learned the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the baby boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, because the wise men had told him the star had first appeared to them about two years before. Then later, when Herod died, God's angel appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, take the child and his mother, and return to Israel. All those who wish to murder the child are dead. So Joseph obeyed. He arose and took the child and his mother, and he re-entered Israel. When he heard, though, that Herod's son had taken over as king in Judea, he was afraid to go there. But then Joseph was directed in a dream to go to the hills of Galilee. On arriving, he settled in the village of Nazareth, fulfilling the words of the prophet, He shall be called a Nazarene. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this is the story of Christmas. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord. Unfold like flowers before the opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill with the light of day. Mortals join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Father's love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love binds
fall from you are all things and to you are all things and you deserve the glory and sing it all and
Well, Jesus, you are worthy of it all. And on this Christmas Eve, we come and we get together and we gather as, as different as it may look. God, you are still good and you are still moving and you are still redeeming and saving and restoring things here on this earth, Jesus. And we need you. We love you. And so I pray in this Christmas Eve message that we would receive your truth today, God, that we would understand all that you are, that we would behold you, we'd lift you up on high, focus on you, see you, and experience you this evening. God, I pray that we wouldn't just watch Christmas Eve this evening, but that we'd actually encounter you in this video, at this time, in church at home. We trust that you are bigger than any one space, God. And so we come before you in love and just in anticipation for what, who you are and for what you've done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, Merry Christmas, Church at Home family. I uh, just want to say before I jump into this short message and before we sing Silent Night together, just want to say on behalf of all of us at Good Shepherd Church, we miss you and we love you. And we are excited to see uh, just in this next season how things might go back even a little more to normal. But for now, just want to say Merry Christmas. I hope it is, is good for you. I know it looks probably a little different at your home, but God is still in this. God is still moving. And I, I really do, like I said, as, just as I was praying, I, I don't want us to just watch Christmas Eve tonight. I want us to encounter Jesus. I want us to behold him. And as we're looking at him, I want him to really change some things for us. Maybe you're new to our church. Maybe this is your first time ever watching something from our church. And I just want to say welcome. Um, I do think one of the beautiful things about this season, even though we aren't gathered together, is that, man, like church is being pushed in a digital way like it hasn't before. And so maybe maybe you do have a friend that uh, you could consider sending this to. There's a lot of people that I don't think are willing to step into a church, especially right now, uh, but maybe ever. And so what a wonderful time that I don't think there's anyone that should go without at least being invited into the story of Christmas this year because of what's happening with COVID. We have this awesome opportunity to push the gospel forward like it's never gone forward before possibly. And so um, I want to dive into this short message today uh, talking about from this idea of humility. And you might say to yourself, man, that's kind of a weird space to start, like you're talking about humility on this Christmas Eve celebration. Um, but really, uh, to be humble, let's just unpack this for a second. To be humble is to is to be able to lower yourself in worth or to lower yourself in stature, in your own personal significance. And, and it comes from this root word, this idea of the earth or the dirt, like bowing so low down to the ground, submitting yourself down low to the ground. And I've learned a couple things about humility over the last few years that you can either do it uh, willingly and you can do it on purpose or you can enter into humility accidentally. And um, so let me just like, listen, I know this has been, it's been a tough year this year. And so I just want to give you a gift this Christmas Eve. And this gift is going to be my most humiliating moment as a person ever. And so um, you just got to promise you're not going to use this uh, to make fun of me at some point. But this is just, this is the lowest of the low. And I'm just doing this to hopefully, I can't give you a Christmas gift in person. So this is the best I can give you. Um, when I was 18, 18 or 19, Katie and I were on this double date at this 18 and up club. If that kind of tells you anything about the level of cool we were walking in when we were that age. Uh, but we went to this club, but there's no alcohol there, obviously. And so it's just like for dancing and for meeting people. And so we're there, we're having a good time and we go to leave. And like I said, we're on a double date. So I'm with a friend and we decide as we're walking out the door that we should, we should give these girls piggyback rides. And so Katie jumps on my back and we're leaving. And as we're leaving, there's this crowd of people outside. Line is out the door. All the actual cool people were showing up at that point. But at that point, it was our curfew. So we had to go. And so there's this bunch of people outside and we decide, me and my friend, that it'd be a good idea to race with these girls on our back. And I'm sure you can already see where this is going, but I take a few hard steps because I'm pretty competitive. So I, I want to win this race, but I bite off more than I can chew in these first few steps. And, and I start to fall forward. My legs just give out and I can feel in that moment, all these eyes just darting and looking at me and like how embarrassing, right? Like I'm dropping my girlfriend. It's not even just that it's all these people seeing, but like the girl that I'm currently like still trying to impress, I'm, I'm sending her over my head as we fall headlong into the street. It was terrible. It was humiliating. Maybe like, I'm sure we all have moments of our life where we accidentally were humiliated or something happened. Somebody said something. We were in front of all these people and we felt embarrassed. We felt lower than we were actually supposed to be. And so you can involuntarily be subject to humil humility or you can choose it. And I think this is a lot more beautiful of a route if you have this choice. I think of like kind of maybe the, 
the textbook story would be like a CEO who's, who's willing to take out the garbage, even though that task is far beneath his value. Like it really is. Like his, his value to a company is maybe worth so much more, and yet he's serving people, caring for people by emptying the garbage, saying there's nothing that's too small for him to take care of. And I think if, if we need anything more in like 2020, we need more humility as people, and we need to choose humility for ourselves. It's funny, you can't make somebody else choose humility. You choose it for yourself in a way that we might lower our preferences, lower the things like the, the high value we have of ourselves. We might, we might like just build somebody else up or serve somebody else, love somebody else in a way. Um, but really, like I, I want to draw us into, the reason I want to talk about this on Christmas Eve is because there has never been and there never will be an act as humiliating as Jesus stepping from heaven to this earth. Like scripture says that he emptied himself and he took on the form of a man. And, and no matter how embarrassed you were at some certain point, no matter how humbled you were in a moment, you have never gone so far as Jesus went all the way from heaven, all the way to earth. Like you, you think about that, how, how much he gave up, how much he laid aside. We've been in this verse for the last few weeks out of the book of Revelation. Then Revelation chapter one, verse eight, it says that, Jesus, like God, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And in this statement, he's not just saying I'm the Alpha and the Omega, I'm the start and the finish, the beginning and the end, but he's saying, and I span all of that. I am the God who is, the God who was, and the God who is to come. Like he has always been, he forever will be God. And we've left off these last two words on purpose to consider them tonight that God was also the one who has been the most and is the most almighty. Like you think about the creature in heaven who, who just opened his mouth and the expanse of the universe fell out. And it's not just that all things were created through Jesus. All things were created by him, for him, and through him. And they're all sustained by him. Like he sustains the universe and all of its motions, all of its systems by his word. Like he, like nations belong to him. He's unrivaled in power, unmatched in authority. The mountains bow down at his name. Like Jesus is so mighty and so powerful. He's not bound by space and time. Like he, he was God. He will be God. He's in all these different areas. He's in all places at all times. He's not taking in any new information. He's never learning anything. He knows everything. He knows everything and his power is limitless. And so it's a humble act then for God to go from walking the halls of heaven to putting on huggies and wearing, wearing a diaper, not being able to control when he would make a mess of his manger. I mean, you think about this, that, that the God who in one moment is, is known and adored and loved by all of heaven goes to this town where he's largely just unknown, where he'll later be mocked and ridiculed and persecuted. Like there, there just isn't a farther step that one could take. Like nobody will ever, no one will ever again, and no one has ever been so humbled as God stepping out of heaven, putting on human flesh and coming to this earth as a baby. Like, like, can you imagine going in one moment from, from knowing everything to all of a sudden not even knowing how to talk? Like he couldn't even communicate to the people that he created how much he cared about them or what he should teach them. Like to be able to be in all times and all spaces, to be present everywhere, it's not being able to move out of your manger. Like this is, this is Jesus. And and on Christmas Eve, we're not drawn to this almighty, all powerful God. We are drawn to behold this meek, powerless little baby. And and the question that we have to ask ourselves on this Christmas Eve in this year is why? Why would a God so powerful do such a thing? And so I just have a few quick reasons, three reasons, and then we will sing Silent Night together. The first is that Jesus came because he loves you. Like the almighty God of the universe loves you, loves you. Like whoever you are watching this, he loves you. And I know that because there's so many different ways I've heard people, or even I myself have tried to write off God's love for me. We can get convinced that God doesn't love me uh, because we know what we've done. We know the sin that we have in our life. We know the mistakes that we've made. We know the things that we've thought that have been terrible. Uh, But here's the deal. Like, God knows everything. He he knows all your thoughts. He knows all the things that you are going to do that you haven't even done yet. And yet we see, and we read in in John 3.16, and John telling the Christmas story, that God so loved the world, for He so loved the world, He gave 
his only son, that whosoever would believe in him would have everlasting, eternal, this abundant life. Like he, he knew who he was coming to save before he came. And so he knows, like there's nothing that you can hide from him, there's nothing that you can conceal from him, and he loves you. The other way that people try to write off God's love is, is that we uh, would never maybe say it this way, but we are so obsessed with a better future version of ourselves that we're convinced that God's going to love us more someday. Maybe once we can finally heal from that hurt or, or get over that addiction, once we can get past that wound, once we can develop that habit that's going to make us a better person, whether that's getting to church or reading your Bible, we get so obsessed with a future better version of ourselves, we can't just stop for a moment and embrace the reality that God loves us for us. He loves you for you right now. Like if there was something that God was waiting for, for you to do, for him to love you more, then he'd still be waiting. He'd still be holding back and sitting in heaven. But like he, he wasn't waiting for you to clean up your mess when he came the first time. He's not waiting for a different version of you in the future. He loves you right now. And the last reason is I think we we're reluctant to really engage with this idea or this conversation of God's love for us because we think our life's just fine without him. I think our life's just fine without him. And maybe your life is fine. Maybe your life is good. Maybe even all that 2020 has had to offer to you and you still would say, yeah, it's been fine. It's been good. And yet we see in John 3.16 that God came to give us a different kind of life than just a good life, just a fine life. But he, There's this theme all throughout scripture of an everlasting life, an abundant life. And so he comes that we might actually experience everlasting life. Like you can live your life without a relationship with God without actually believing in who he is. But you cannot walk in the fullness of life that he intended for you until you encounter his love. The other reason that he came down to this earth was, would be to sympathize with us. Like, so you got to kind of wrap your mind around this, that we actually have a God who cares so much about our human experience that he voluntarily humbled himself into it personally. Like we forget, I think all the time that Jesus was a person he, he was a real life guy just being a dude. He had friends who, who abandoned him, who betrayed him. He had friends who, who like he was counting on them to do something and they, they didn't come through for him. He lost people he loved. He grieved. He lamented. He experienced joy. Like, like Jesus had the human experience of hunger and thirst. How ironic that the God who spoke all the waters into existence on the earth has to wait at one point for a well to deliver him from his thirst. Like this, this is the God we serve. And he came into our human experience so that we would have a great high priest who sympathizes with us. So it wouldn't be falling as just some distant, like far off God who can't relate to us at all. But we have one who voluntarily stepped into our humanity to serve and to save those he loved. And, and so like this is our God, not one who's far removed from our pain and suffering, but one who chose to experience it personally so that he would know what we're walking through, so that he would feel the things that we've felt. And gosh, doesn't that give us just a, a bedrock of peace in a time like this? That nothing that we're going through, no temptation that you're facing, no frustration that you're in the middle of, has God not walked through himself personally. And so you're never alone. You're never alone through what you're going through. God has been there personally. Like I think about the loneliness right now that you may be feeling stuck, at, stuck in your house, having to watch church at home right now. And this is not what you wanted. You wanted to be in the church this, this evening. Maybe you just wanted to be with your family this holiday season. And you're, and you're stuck at home. Like God's felt that loneliness. He's felt that pain of not being able to be around the people that he wants to be with. And so we have a God who can relate to us. We have a God who empathizes and sympathizes with our humanity. And the last one is that God came to offer us life. God came to offer us a life, um, a life that is different than one that we would just consider fine. I would argue that God's most humiliating moment was not the moment he was born and became this weak, like little baby that couldn't do anything. God's most humiliating moment was the moment he went to the cross and, and our almighty God endured a physical death. Like the people who he loved and created, he let kill him. There was, there's never been anything more humbling than that moment where God, where God chose 
to become the, the payment for our sins. You see, because God created this rule that uh, he's going to order the world to work in a certain way. And he's going to give creation these certain parameters to work in. And if any of his creation disobeys that or goes contrary to the rules that he's created, we call that sin. And every single one of us has entered into that sin. But we don't have a God who just sits there and waits for us to deal with our own sin. We, came, we serve a God who came down from heaven to deal with that sin for us so that we wouldn't have to settle for a substitute sacrifice. He he stepped in, took the punishment that you and I deserve on that cross. Why? So that we may encounter his everlasting, his abundant life. This whole series, we've considered how God came to give us hope. And we've really been looking at all this through the lens of and hope. And I, I think the, the gift in such a crazy, tumultuous year where maybe, maybe, your, maybe your comfort got shaken up a little bit. You're uneasy about how your money used to feel, make you feel so secure. And now you're not really sure who's going to be providing for you next year. That, that stimulus check wasn't as much as you were counting on. And now here we are not feeling as secure in our finances. Maybe your relationship is strained right now. Your marriage is tough because you've had to spend so much time in your house over this year. Maybe you're, you're just feeling a little more powerless than you used to because you, don't, you don't, maybe don't trust the political system like you used to. And maybe there, like, there's all sorts of different things being bombarded with us. Like, gosh, the, the need for approval has never been higher. Like, it's so hard to have people just approve of you. And, and we can't just seem to agree to disagree anymore. Like, it's all of a sudden this, I'm against you and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not on your side. I'm not following you because you think this. And I hope, like, the grace that I think is in this moment that we're in right now is that God is showing us that where we're turning to for power, where we're turning to for comfort or for control or for, for this uh, sense of belonging or acceptance, approval, like all these things that we keep turning to are not really satisfying what our soul most desperately needs. And enter into that story, into that space, into this moment, a small little baby Jesus, a God so full of humility that he's willing to step down out of heaven, lay aside his divinity to take on human skin because he loves us. He's compelled not by judgment, but by love. He's compelled to us by love. He's, he's willing to empathize with the things that we've experienced. And he's doing this so that he can save us, save us, and so he can bear the punishment that we deserved. You see, because Christmas is when Jesus humbled himself as a human, uh, but that's not going to happen again. You see, the next time that Jesus comes, it's not going to be as a meek infant. It's going to be as a mighty lion, uh, the, the king of all kings. And in him, following after him, provides us a kingdom that's filled with everlasting life. And so I just want to challenge you today. If you, if you find this message today and you need a new place to put your hope, I just want to pray with you right now. I want to pray with you in this moment. And I want this to be the, the time that you decide, not just with words that I'm saying, but as a prayer that you, are, that, you are, that you are taking in in your heart. And you're going, yes, God, this is me. Would we just, would we just yield to him? And we would just put our trust in him in the hope that he provides. And so I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite you just to pray with me. And if wherever you're at, if you just want to kind of close your eyes and open your hands up, if you want to receive this prayer, just want to repeat after me and say, Jesus, I need you. I have trusted in other things for far too long and they keep letting me down. And so God, here I am. You can have my heart. You can have my obedience. I'm yours. I want this life I want to drink from this well that you are offering today. Jesus, we pray that we would fix our eyes on you. And if you've just confessed that prayer, I'll just say that's the best decision you could have made in your life. And, and that's like, this is the, the moment where you're now transferred. Your hope has been moved from this world to a new kingdom. And you're now following after Jesus. And so I think there's a couple steps for you to take if you just prayed that prayer confessing that you need him in your life. And the first one would just be to talk to somebody about it. My phone number, like my actual phone number is going to go up on the screen right now. And, and if you want to text me, if you need someone to talk to you about this, you don't have anyone in your life that you can talk to about this, send me a text. Like I'm just a regular guy. I have a wife. I have kids. I drive a 1994 Jeep Grand Cherokee. Like that's me. You could text me. We could talk about this, but maybe you just want to talk to the person who sent this to you. Maybe you want to talk to somebody on our team, not me. You can go to our website, gschurch.info, click the I'm new button. Let us know what God is doing in your heart. We'd love to connect you to our church. We think this is an awesome church. We're starting a new series in January. We'd love for you to participate in. 
uh, but maybe you're out of town watching this somewhere else, we'd love to just help you get connected to a church because a church is not just where you're going to go to make Jesus love you more. It's a people that you're going to belong to, a family that you're going to get to be a part of. And so I think that's a great step for you to take. Um, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump into Silent Night together. Jesus, thank you for this wonderful time on Christmas Eve, looking nothing like we thought it did, and yet here you are. You are good. You are good, and we love you. God, I pray as we sing this song, as we maybe even light candles of our own, God, would you help us not to just do something to kind of end our Christmas Eve, but would you actually help us see that you are the light of the world and the darkness cannot overpower the light. And so I pray as candles are being lit all over, as we sing this, would we be singing and praying that the light of the world would light up the dark places in our life, that you would, that you would push back the darkness in our marriage? Would you push back the darkness in our family, the, push back the darkness in our jobs, God, wherever it is that we're needing you. Would this candle be so much more than just some kind of routine thing that we do on Christmas? But would it be symbolic of the light of the world overcoming this world? Jesus, we love you. We're grateful for you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
We've had a great time celebrating the birth of our Savior with you. If you've made a decision to follow Jesus today, we'd love to hear from you. Simply text Pastor Austin or go to gschurch.info and click the Know God tab. We'd love to get connected with you. And if you want to stay up to date with everything happening here at GSC, follow us on social media at GSC Loveland. We would love for you to join us in the new year for our new series, According to the Spirit, that kicks off Sunday, January 3rd. Finally, if you would like to partner with us financially and participate in what God is doing in and through Good Shepherd, go to gschurch.info forward slash giving. To ensure that your gift is deductible for 2020 tax purposes, be sure to donate by December 31st. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas, Good Shepherd family! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! We love you, church fam! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! From all of us here at Good Shepherd, Merry Christmas. We hope you have an awesome day and a happy new year. We love you, church fam. We'll see you soon.